Hi guys! In this video we'll be looking at nebulae, protostar, nuclear fusion, stable star, and we'll finish with a summary. First of all, we're going to learn about the very first stage in a star's lifetime, which is called a nebula. And to do so we're going to use a very simple analogy. When a surface has not been cleaned in a while, you sometimes see dust bunching together, for example into a dust ball like this one here. Why does this happen? Well, it occurs because the dust particles have a charge, so electrostatic forces cause them to attract and coagulate, or come together. Let's consider these two dust particles here. One is positively charged, while the other has a net negative charge. This means that they're going to feel a force of electrostatic attraction between them. This very simple process is essentially what occurs in the very first stage of star formation. Even the most massive stars in the universe started out as small specks of dust and gas, like those in this image below. These dust and gas particles attract each other and begin to coagulate. As the mass of the dust ball increases, so does its gravity, and so more particles are attracted due to the additional gravitational force. So here we have dust particles coming into the centre, and this is going to result in an increase in mass, as well as an increase in gravitational force g. Now this process doesn't happen overnight. It occurs over millions of years, forming gigantic clouds of dust and gas called nebulae. And these nebulae are the birthplace of stars. And here we've got an illustration of a nebula. Nebulae are so dense that they block the light from surrounding stars, so we observe them as dark structures against a bright starry background. For example, in this image, we see lots and lots of stars and a dark shape at the centre which is a nebula cloud. Now we're going to discuss the second stage in a star's lifetime, which is a protostar. As the nebula cloud continues to gain more dust and gas particles, its mass is going to increase. So as these dust particles are attracted towards the centre of the nebula, its mass is going to increase. An increase in mass will result in a large gravitational pull between particles, which brings them closer together and increases the density of the cloud. So as these particles come towards the centre, the density is going to increase, and remember that we give density the Greek symbol rho. This process is called gravitational collapse. The more massive the cloud becomes, the faster this collapse occurs, as these particles accelerate towards the centre. The dust cloud isn't uniform. It has some regions which have a larger mass than others. As the cloud collapses, an uneven distribution of mass within the nebula means that the density in some regions will grow faster than others. And on this image, you can see that these areas are darker because they contain more dust particles, and therefore they have a higher density. The presence of more mass in these regions means that they have a greater gravitational pull and attract more gas and dust particles, which further increases their density. Let's consider this region here, which has a higher density than the areas around it it's going to attract more and more dust particles towards it, which will in turn increase the density further. As particles come together, their gravitational potential energy is going to be converted to thermal energy, which causes the temperature of these regions to increase rapidly. So consider a dust particle coming from the outer region of the cloud towards this area. It's gonna have gravitational potential energy being converted into thermal energy which results in a higher temperature in this area here. And this process is going to form a very hot, dense sphere of dust and gas in the dense region of the cloud, which is what we call the core. And this forms what is known as a protostar. To know how a star can evolve from a protostar to a star, we need to understand a process called nuclear fusion. To form a star, the protostar must begin to radiate energy, like so. It does this via the process of nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the process of converting hydrogen to helium, releasing large amounts of energy in the form of kinetic energy. Let's consider these four hydrogen nuclei here. These can fuse together to form one helium atom and release a lot of energy in the process. In order for nuclear fusion to occur, the temperature and pressure inside the core of the protostar needs to be extremely high. At the core, the temperature needs to be high. How can we reach these high temperatures and pressures? 
Well, they'll eventually be reached if the protostar gains enough mass and so is sufficiently dense. So as mass is being attracted towards the core of the protostar, it has the effect of increasing density, rho, and therefore temperature and pressure will both increase. And this leads to the formation of a star. Now, why do we need such high temperatures in order for nuclear fusion to take place? Well, at the point where nuclear fusion begins, the kinetic energy of the hydrogen nuclei must be high enough to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between them. Recall that hydrogen nuclei have a positive charge. That means that they're going to experience a force of electrostatic repulsion, moving them away from each other. At low temperatures, the kinetic energy of these hydrogen nuclei is not going to be strong enough to overcome the electrostatic repulsion and so nuclear fusion cannot take place. However, if we take the hydrogen nuclei to a high enough temperature, they're still going to be experiencing this electrostatic repulsion force. However, if the temperature is high enough, the kinetic energy is going to be large enough to overcome this electrostatic repulsion and allow nuclear fusion to take place. These hydrogen nuclei fuse to create helium. Nuclear fusion releases large amounts of energy that radiates away from the star, making the star bright. Now that we've learned about the process of nuclear fusion, we can talk about what keeps the star stable. Once a star begins fusing hydrogen in its core, it starts radiating away large amounts of energy. So in the core, hydrogen to helium fusion is taking place. And this causes there to be a large amount of energy being radiated away from the star. This is electromagnetic radiation, so it is carried by photons, and these produce a pressure that acts radially outwards from the centre of the star, known as the radiation pressure. So if we have our photons carrying the energy away from the centre of the star, they're going to produce a pressure known as the radiation pressure, which I'll call PR. And this radiation pressure acts in the same direction as another pressure, which is produced by collisions between nuclei in the core and known as the gas pressure. So here we've got the radiation pressure acting radially outwards and the gas pressure which is also acting radially outwards, which I'll call P gas. Both of these pressures act together in the opposite direction to the gravitational forces acting to compress the star. So here we have gravitational forces acting inwards trying to compress the star which I'll call Fg, and this is opposed by the combination of the radiation pressure and the gas pressure, Pr plus P gas. When these opposing forces are in balance, the star is said to be in equilibrium and is stable, remaining the same size in a spherical shape. During this stable phase, the star is said to be on the main sequence. I will understand what the main sequence means when we look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram a bit later on. All you need to know for now is that when a star is on the main sequence, the force of gravity is exactly balanced by the radiation and gas pressures. The length of time a star spends on the main sequence is dependent on its size and mass. More massive stars have much hotter cores, as a result they have a faster rate of hydrogen fusion. So this star has a hotter core. This means that more massive stars are going to use up all of the hydrogen available for fusion much quicker than less massive stars, and so have a shorter lifetimes on the main sequence. And in this hot core, we have faster hydrogen burning. These lifetimes are still significantly longer than the other phases of a star's life, ranging from a few million years for the most massive stars to tens of billions of years for smaller stars like our sun. So here we've got examples of two stars, one with a mass of one solar mass, so similar to our sun, and the other with a mass of about 40 solar masses. And the less massive star is going to have a lifetime of about 10 on the main sequence, whereas this star that's 40 solar masses is going to only have a lifetime of about 1 million years. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, Join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap reply smiley face and together let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.